Have you ever struggled between knowing and doing God's will? You are not the only one. Jeremiah's journey of obedience reveals the challenges he experienced as he sought to understand and fulfill God's purposes for his life. Even after he made the decision to obey God, many pressures and persecutions led him to question whether he had done the right thing. In the process, Jeremiah wrestled with some of life's most difficult questions, questions that we too can face. Listening friend, reading Jeremiah gives us the opportunity to gain knowledge and perspective about what it means to serve God even in difficult times. It helps us discover practical wisdom for each day as we seek to follow God in the midst of opposition. Welcome dear and distinguished listener, today we present to you the story of the prophet Jeremiah. Join us on this journey through the sacred scriptures and let's see this shocking story together. Before delving into this topic, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and activate the notification bell so that YouTube notifies you every time we publish a new video. Let's get started. Jeremiah, the prophet of the broken heart, is the author of the Book of Lamentations and the book that bears his name. It is one of the most notable books in the Bible. Every book of the Bible is remarkable, but this book of Jeremiah is remarkable in an unusual way. Most prophets hide themselves and maintain a character of anonymity. That is to say, they do not project themselves onto the pages of their prophecies. But here we have a prophet whose prophecy is largely autobiographical. He has left us much of his own personal history. In chapter 1 of Jeremiah, we can see that the prophet, he was the son of Hilkiah. Hilkiah was the high priest who found the book of the Law of Moses during the time of King Josiah. Let's read in the second book of Kings, chapter 22, verse 8 onwards. Then Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the Law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. Then Shaphan the scribe came to the king, and he reported to the king and said, your servants have collected the money that was found in the temple and have delivered it into the hands of those who do the work, who are in charge of the arrangement of the house of Jehovah. Likewise, Shaphan the scribe declared to the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book, and Shaphan read it before the king. Listening friend, the discovery of the law of the Lord given to Moses caused a spiritual renewal during the reign of Josiah, Renewal movements are not caused by men, but by the Word of God. The Word of God is responsible for every renewal movement that has taken place in the church. It is true that God has used men, but it was the Word of God that brought that renewal. Now, Jeremiah, being the son of Hilkiah the priest, was also born a priest in the city of Anathoth, north of Jerusalem. Jeremiah began his ministry about a century after Isaiah, in chapter 1, we can see the call of Jeremiah. Let's read from verse 4 onwards. So the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I sanctified you. I gave you as a prophet to the nations. And I said, Ah, ah, Lord Jehovah. The thing is, I do not know how to talk, because I'm a child. And the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am a child. For you will go to everything I send you, and you will say everything I send you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. We are glad that Jeremiah's mother did not believe in abortion, because then this great prophet would not have been born. He was a person from the very moment he was conceived. In Psalm 139, King David said, My body was not hidden from you, well, I was formed in secret and woven together in the depths of the earth. That is, he was formed in his mother's womb, and at that moment, his life began. Because there is great development of the fetus at the very beginning of the gestation process. Abortion is a crime. That's the way God's Word looks at this issue. 
God said to Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born I sanctified you, I consecrated you. Let us notice Jeremiah's response to God's call. And I said, Ah, ah, Lord Jehovah, behold, I know not how to speak, for I am a child. In those days, Jeremiah was probably about 20 years old, but given the words of this verse, we cannot imagine him being that age. In reality, he was not a child in the way you and I think of a child. The word child here is the same word that was translated young man in Zechariah chapter 2 verse 4, where the angel said to Zechariah, Run, speak to this young man. In truth, Jeremiah was a young man, and what he wanted to say was this, I am young, a person without experience. I am not capable of carrying out such a task. I do not consider myself prepared for it. Now, dear listener, have you realized that the person God uses is the one who thinks he can't do things? If you think you can do them today, then, dear listener, we don't believe God can use you. On one occasion, a person carrying out a certain Christian ministry went to a veteran servant of God of great experience to complain, full of jealousy towards other people, and said to him, I have more capacity than that person, better preparation, greater ease with words, and I would like to know why God is using that person and not me. The veteran teacher replied, Your problem is that you consider yourself capable and competent to do everything. The other person, to whom you are referring, believes that you cannot carry out your ministry for God by yourself. And the fact is that God always uses that kind of people. God chooses people who are aware of their weakness. Jeremias felt insufficient, incapable, unprepared. Let's listen to the answer that God gave him. And the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am a child, for you will go to whatever I send you, and you will say whatever I command you. In these words to Jeremiah, we see that the prophet would proclaim his message with an authority given by God himself. Therefore, these words that served as encouragement and comfort to him are also valid for all those who spread the word of God. The Lord also said to Jeremiah, Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Here we see the security that these words convey. Do not be afraid in front of them. That security turns the task of proclaiming the word of God into an enjoyable task. That is why God told him to go wherever he sent him to communicate his message with conviction and courage. The word will never return void, but will fulfill the purpose for which God sent it. More and more people are needed to speak with authority about what God has written in his word. This is all he asks us to do. In one sense, it is a simple task, and in another sense, it is a very difficult task. God said to Jeremiah, Don't be afraid, because I am with you to free you. It's as if he had told her, Don't worry, I'm on your side. Martin Luther said, One person with God constitutes a majority. And this has always been true. As Christians, we may think that we are in the minority, but when it comes down to it, we are in the majority. Now, Jeremiah began his work during the reign of Josiah, king of Judah. Josiah was eight years old when he came to the throne, and he reigned for 31 years. Jeremiah began his ministry when Josiah was 22 years old. And as we said previously, apparently Jeremiah was also 20 years old, so they were both young and probably friends. Jeremiah prophesied during 18 years of Josiah's reign and was one of those who expressed his pain at the king's funeral, as we can see in the second book of Chronicles, chapter 35, verse 25. And Jeremiah mourned in memory of Josiah. All male and female singers recite these lamentations about Josiah to this day, and they made them a rule for mourning in Israel, which are written in the book of Lamentations. Dear listener, Jeremiah mourned his death because Josiah had been a good king. The last spiritual renewal occurred under the reign of Josiah, and it was a great renewal. After Josiah's death, Jeremiah would see that the nation would fall into a dark night, from which it would not emerge until after the Babylonian captivity, and it was Jeremiah himself who predicted this 70-year captivity. He also saw beyond the darkness of captivity the light, 
No other prophet spoke so brightly with so much enthusiasm about the future. And on the other hand, Jeremiah has been called the weeping prophet, but not in a derogatory sense. He spent most of his life shedding tears. God chose this man, who had a motherly heart, a trembling voice, and tear-filled eyes, to communicate a stern message of judgment. The message he had to proclaim broke his own heart. This man was a great servant of God. Honestly speaking, I don't think you or I would have chosen this kind of man to deliver such a harsh message. Instead, we would have chosen some tough person to convey that kind of message, right? But God did not choose that type of man, but rather he chose a man with a tender and compassionate heart. A certain author has written the following about Jeremiah. He was not powerful like Elijah, eloquent like Isaiah, poor and humble like Ezekiel, but a timid, shameful man, conscious of his helplessness, eager to receive compassion and love that he would never know. Such was the instrument through which the word of the Lord reached that corrupt and degenerate era. You and I, my listening friend, are perhaps living in a time that probably resembles that of Jeremiah. We see great nations that have made great technological advances. Man has undertaken the conquest of space and has created weapons of enormous destructive power. However, within the great powers there is corruption which will really lead to dismemberment and disaster, and that end does not seem to be very far away. Now, after the death of King Josiah, his son Jehoahaz would succeed him on the throne of Judah. The second book of Chronicles, chapter 36, left us with the story omitted here. Jehoahaz, son of Josiah, was not mentioned in Jeremiah's account. He reigned for three months and was deposed. Then the king of Egypt placed Eliakim, brother of Jehoahaz, on the throne and changed his name to Jehoiakim. He reigned for eleven years and Jeremiah advised him not to fight against Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. However, Jehoiakim did not accept Jeremiah's advice and was taken captive to Babylon. After the overthrow of Eliakim, or Jehoiakim, the king of Babylon placed Jehoiakim on the throne of Jerusalem. He reigned for three months and ten days and was not mentioned here in the book of Jeremiah because he barely occupied the throne, since shortly after he was overthrown and deported by Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon. Later, Nebuchadnezzar appointed Zedekiah, Jehoiachin's uncle, to the throne in Jerusalem. He reigned for eleven years in Jerusalem. When Zedekiah rebelled, Nebuchadnezzar went to Jerusalem and destroyed it, killed Zedekiah's sons and took Zedekiah's eyes, taking him captive to Babylon. This story tells us brutal events. But we must also remember that King Nebuchadnezzar was very patient with the city of Jerusalem. Let us also remember that the people refused to listen to the warning that God gave them through Jeremiah. He constantly warned of impending disaster, caused by the nation's neglect of true religion, its tendency toward pagan practices, and its social injustice. Jeremiah's message was the most unpleasant ever communicated to a people, and it was rejected. He was considered a traitor to his country because he said they had to surrender to Babylon. The prophet Isaiah, almost a century before him, had spoken of resisting. Why this change? In Jeremiah's day, there was only one thing left to do, surrender. The desolation of Judah would not be the result of historical chance, but of its sin, which is why Jeremiah demanded the conversion of the people and the king. Because of his dire predictions against Judah, Jeremiah was continually subjected to persecution, ridicule, and hostility from kings and rulers, and was even thrown into a cistern full of mud or black water. As we read in Jeremiah chapter 38 verse 6, then they took Jeremiah and cast him into the cistern of Malchiah the son of Hamelech, which was in the courtyard of the prison. And they tied Jeremiah up with ropes. And in the cistern there was no water, but mire, and Jeremiah sank in the mire. King Zedekiah was a weak man, easily influenced by others. When the princes of Judah demanded that Jeremiah be thrown into the abyss, he agreed. The intention of the princes was clearly to kill Jeremiah. However, in the most hypocritical way, they would not want to take the blame for shedding his blood. So instead of pushing him into the dungeon and letting him fall, which would probably open a wound and cause blood to be shed, the prophet was carefully lowered by ropes into the cistern, where he would die a slow death from hunger, exposure, or disease, but technically without bloodshed. This cistern in Malchiah's house, without water but with silt, 
was undoubtedly a cistern. Most houses in Jerusalem had private cisterns to store water collected from rain or a spring. They were usually pear-shaped with a small opening at the top, which could be covered if necessary to prevent accidents or water contamination. Listening friend, the prophet Jeremiah has left us much of his own personal history. Let's go over his life for a moment through a list of facts about him, so that you can get to know this great man of God. Number 1. He was forbidden to marry because of the terrible times in which he lived. Let's read Jeremiah chapter 16 verse 1 onwards. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, You shall not take a wife for yourself, nor have sons or daughters in this place. For thus says the Lord concerning the sons and daughters who are born in this place, their mothers who bear them, and their fathers who bear them in this land. They will die from painful diseases. They will not be mourned or buried. They will be like dung on the face of the earth. They will be consumed by sword and by famine, and their bodies will be food for the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. Listening friend, God revealed to Jeremiah the horrors that would come and told him not to marry. We believe the reason was quite obvious. If one reads Psalm 137, written before the Babylonian captivity, one can see the fate they suffered. In the last two verses, it is said that Babylon would be destroyed and that they would do to her just as she had done to the people of Judah. Psalm 137 verses 8 and 9 says, Daughter of Babylon the desolate, blessed is he who repays you for what you did to us. Blessed is he who will take and smash your children against the rock. When King Nebuchadnezzar took the city of Jerusalem, the conquerors took the children and dashed them against the stones. God asked Jeremiah not to marry because he wanted to spare the prophet that anguish. Number 2. Jeremiah never managed to convert anyone. He was rejected by his people. He was hated, beaten, put in the stocks. He was put in jail and accused of being a traitor. Number 3. His message broke his own heart. Let's read Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 1. Oh, that my head would be filled with water and my eyes would be filled with tears, that I might mourn day and night for the dead of the daughter of my people. This was the effect it had on Jeremiah. How did he deliver his message? Was he a man with a harsh character, who liked to criticize others and exclude them? No, he stood there delivering the message while tears ran down his cheeks. The message he had to communicate broke his heart. Centuries later, the people of Israel saw Jesus weeping over the city of Jerusalem when he had to communicate a harsh message to that city. And then the Jews remembered Jeremiah, the prophet who wept. And some even thought that Jesus was Jeremiah who had returned, and they had very good reason to believe it. For Jeremiah was a man of sorrows, acquainted with suffering. The difference between him and the Lord Jesus was that the Lord Jesus was carrying our pain and sorrow while Jeremiah was carrying his own burden, and it was breaking his heart. Once Jeremiah turned to the Lord and said, I can't go on. This thing is destroying me. I'm about to have a nervous breakdown. It would be better if you turned to someone else. And the Lord, in a way, it was as if he had said to him, Very well, but I will keep your resignation on my desk, because I believe that you will return. And Jeremiah came back and said in his chapter 20, verse 9, And I said, I will remember him no more, neither will I speak any more in his name. However, there was in my heart like a burning fire embedded in my bones. I tried to suffer it, and I couldn't. Listening friend, Jeremiah communicated the message, but it broke his heart. God wanted to have that kind of man because he was the right man to deliver such a severe message. God wanted the Israelites to know that although he was sending them into captivity and in doing so was judging them, that fact was breaking his divine heart. Number 4. Jeremiah saw the destruction of Jerusalem and the captivity in Babylon. The captain of the Babylonian forces allowed him to remain in his land. When the remnant wanted to flee to Egypt, Jeremiah prophesied against that desire. He was forced to go with the remnant to Egypt as we read in Jeremiah chapter 43 verses 6 and 7. Men and women and children, and the king's daughters, 
and everyone whom Nebuzaradan captain of the guard had left with Gedaliah the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, and to the prophet Jeremiah and Baruch the son of Neriah, and they entered the land of Egypt, because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. And they came to Tapanhes. Consequently, Johanan and the captains forced the remnant of the people to head to Egypt, including the prophet Jeremiah in the group. So they returned to Tapanhes, a place that was near where they had begun their life as a nation, in the land of Goshen, in Egypt. And they forced Jeremiah to accompany them, but he continued speaking to them anyway. The interesting thing was that they fled to the land of Egypt to escape Nebuchadnezzar. But God was going to allow Nebuchadnezzar to take over the land of Egypt. And then they would be worse off than if they had obeyed God and stayed in their land. They would be under Nebuchadnezzar's rule again, but then they were out of their land, and Nebuchadnezzar would make them slaves. Jeremiah is believed to have died in Egypt. According to tradition, he was stoned by the remnant of Israelites. So only with these data we can verify that Jeremiah was a remarkable man. Listening friend, to have a panoramic view of the book of Jeremiah, we are going to include a simple outline of the main titles or themes that, on the other hand, coincide with the stages of the prophet's life. Number 1. Call of the Prophet During the Reign of Josiah We can see this in chapter 1. Number 2. Prophecies for Judah and Jerusalem Prior to the Reign of Zedekiah Chapters 2 to 20. Number 3. Prophecies during the reign of Zedekiah. Chapters 21 to 29. Number 4. Prophecies regarding the future of the twelve tribes and about the imminent captivity of Judah. Chapters 30 to 39. Number 5. Prophecies for the remnant left in Judah after the destruction of Jerusalem. Chapters 40 to 42. Number 6. Prophecies during Jeremiah's last days in Egypt. Chapters 43 to 51. Number 7. Fulfillment of the prophesied destruction of Jerusalem. Chapter 52. Dear listeners, Jeremiah shared with us much of his story, more than most prophets. His transparency helps us see not only his challenges, but also his feelings about these experiences. He identified with God's broken heart toward his people, and in turn, God identified with Jeremiah's suffering. This makes it difficult to recognize who is speaking at certain times. What are the words describing? God's emotions, Jeremiah's, or both? Jeremiah warned Judah of God's future judgment with impassioned, often tearful speeches. These words were difficult to say, but they were never harshly stated. They evidence God's pain as he tirelessly tried to reach a rebellious people and was forced to bring judgment on their persistent sins. This is why even in the midst of imminent destruction, we discover promises of hope about the future redemption of Judah. Having seen how this principle worked in the history of his own rebellious people, Jeremiah would reflect on how God's mercy transcends his own judgment. He wrote, by the mercy of the Lord we are not consumed, for his mercies never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God's message announced through Jeremiah. Although it brings pain, it also shows compassion because of the greatness of his unfailing love. For he takes no pleasure in hurting people or causing them pain. And so we come to the end of this video. Thank you very much for being part of our channel. God bless you greatly. From me, that's all for today. And with me, it will be until a next video.